so let us start begin uh, let me welcome you all to the week 4 lecture pmrf nptel uh, session on the course introduction to developmental biology as we have been doing it the past weeks this particular video will be recorded and in this particular session we will be solving various assignment questions for the previous years course run and we will try to solve them together interactively in order to understand the various concepts behind the questions and better understand the week's particular lecture. So let me reintroduce myself. My name is Arnav Chatterjee. I am a Prime Minister Research Fellow and PhD Scholar under the supervision of Professor Jonaki Sen at the Brain Developmental Biology Lab, Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. So this week's particular, let us begin this week's session and uh, to start off, I would like to refresh your memory about what was exactly dealt with the last week in the lectures themselves. What we did were uh, looked at various mutation screens and tried to understand how exactly we can identify various mutants based on developmental genetics and the phenotypes that they, that the F2 progeny will show us. So this is one of the slides from the lecture itself. I will just quickly go through it so we will have a context of what we are going to answer in these week's assignments questions. So in order for mutant, mutant isolation, the entire the entire word plan is that we use a chemical mutagen that will hit uh, the and organism's genome only once in a particular gene and by using this particular chemical mutagen such as EMS which is ethyl methyl sulfonate we create point uh, we create mutations in one gene in a lot of organisms so we have 10 thousands uh, tens of thousands of p0s that are present here that will give rise to an f1 progeny and in case of c elegans selfing is a thing that in which uh, the hermaphrodite has uh, can by itself undergo mating with uh, so the hermaphrodites can produce oocytes and sperms and the, those fertilize each other and we essentially have a heterozygous F1 progeny in case we have a mutation in the P0. So using an EMS uh, EMS method we create a mutation M in the P0 uh, progeny then self the C elegans and in the F1 we have a heterozygous population of M and plus but most of the case in if the mutation itself is recessive we have to go to the F2 generation again selfing the worms and we will have these three uh, genotypes and finally our particular uh, phenotype will be displayed by the M over M recessive uh, homozygous worms and in this particular example we were trying to identify genes that were involved in vulva formation and in case there is a defect in vulva formation the various eggs that were already fertilized do not exit the parent worm and thus they the worm looks like the worm essentially has a bag of worms inside it and that is the distinct phenotype that is observed in this mutational screen and this is how we do this mutant screen this can be done separately in various organisms such as yeast drosophila and we can look for various phenotypes and identify genes which are related to them. For example, in case we require to identify genes that are affected by temperature sensitivity in say yeast. So what we do is we do the entire experiment and we increase the temperature. We uh, essentially pool the yeast in two parts and have a permissive temperature of our, around 23 degrees Celsius for one pool and a non-permissive temperature of higher temperature where the temperature sensitive cell regulation genes will not be working. In that particular, in the second pool, many of the yeast colonies will not grow and comparing with the first one, we can identify various mutants and then trace back from those mutants what genes were involved. So is the whole idea of mutational screens clear how we go along with it? Yes, no, anyone. If you have any questions, you can just go ahead and answer because this is essentially what the entire week's lecture is on.
So everyone understood what mutational screens and mutant isolations are. A simple yes or no will also work. Just go in the chat box and write you did not understand or you did. Hello? Am I audible at all? Hello? Okay. And the screen is visible, I guess. Yes? So everyone understood what mutational screens are all about, right? Or should, would you like me to repeat what I It's okay. So we go on to the first question, so our first question that we are going to deal with in this week. The question is, why inferring gene function is difficult from phenotype of a dominant mutant? So going back to the mutational screen, Say using the uh, chemical mutation EMS, you got a mutant that was dominant in the F1 progeny. That is, this M is dominant over the wild type ID. So the question is, why inferring gene function is difficult from phenotype of a dominant mutation? The options are, dominance could result from any of a number of types of changes. Dominant mutations always misexpress a gene. Dominant mutations cause ectopic expression and dominant mutations are usually toxic. So this is a round answer type of question. So only one of the answers are correct. I would encourage everyone to try and answer the question. You can just go ahead and put it in the chat box. So this was something that was uh, dealt with in the lectures itself that why a dominant mutation in if a dominant mutation is found out it is difficult to deal with what do you think is the answer anyone see dominant mutation cause ectopic expression okay anyone else wants to try So Mulyani says C, dominant mutations cause ectopic expression. So what exactly is ectopic expression, Mulyani, can you explain that? Like what does ectopic mean? Okay, so ectopic, what ectopic means is that the expression of the gene is in a place that is first not in the wild type, say for eye development, a particular gene such as PAC6 will be uh, expressed in the eyes but ectopic expression means that it will be expressed somewhere else say towards the wing part or towards the antenna and this is what ectopic expression means the expression when the expression occurs at a place where it does not occur in the wild so this is what Milani say so let us look into the solution slide so uh, what is it about the dominant mutations after performing a mutagenesis screen, inferring functions of dominant mutations are not easy. The main important cause of it is that dominant mutations can be caused by three types of changes in the uh, genotype of the organism. These might be hypermorphic in which, uh, say in a particular uh, gene path, uh, in a biosynthetic pathway, the dominant mutation starts by increasing the amount of the enzyme that was being produced that is uh, that is known as the hypermorphic mutation and if that is the case then a lot of particular gene product will be produced that is not essentially needed by the cell and that might cause various problems dominant mutations can also cause neomorphic changes in which uh, the dominant mutation causes a separate entirely new 
function to be caused and it can be antimorphic in nature as well in which the normal gene function is completely reversed so because dominant mutation can cause all of this you cannot go back and trace what the wild type function of the dominant mutation was because all of this can occur from the dominant mutation as well thus usually isolation of recessive loss of function alleles also will be required in order to understand what exactly the original function of the gene was so a dominant allele will not help us much because of these reasons that a dominant allele can result in a number of changes in the phenotype of the organism and we cannot trace back what exactly what was the wild type function of the particular gene and thus a recessive loss of function is often needed thus the answer to the question is dominance could result from any of a number of types of changes and thus we cannot trace back to exactly what the function of the wild type gene is that is why it is difficult to uh, difficult to infer function from the dominant mutation is that okay anyone has anything to add to this i guess not so let us continue the next question is epistasis analysis is used for the options are identifying additional genes in a genetic pathway positioning a new gene in the hierarchy of a known gene genetic pathway discovering a new gene the fungal gene that functions redundantly with a known gene and determining the tissue or cell lineage of action of a gene so these are the four options again a round type answer that is we only have one kind of type of correct one answer that is only correct so anyone wants to try and answer the question So, in order to answer this question, let us first look into what exactly epistasis is. So, epistasis, uh, epistatic analysis, is the genetic method used to identify groups of genes controlling a particular cellular pathway or process, and to establish an order of function map that reflects the sequence of events in a pathway controlled by various genes. so if essentially the epistasis analysis can give us the order or the hierarchy in which particular genetic biosynthetic pathway is working say in the glycolysis pathway we have various genes that are working 1 2 3 4 5 uh, and the order of the working of the genes are what uh, are determined using the epistasis analysis so the uh, what exactly it helps us determine is sequential substrate product along an enzymatic pathway successive structures formed during development of an organ so the second point means is that uh, what second point means is say during heart development first the cardiomyocyte in order to form the heart first need to form various minute tubules then di- uh, differentiate into muscles and then form the entire structure via the process of morphogenesis and this will be in a sequential fashion and using epistasis analysis we can actually determine which particular process starts earlier and which comes after so essentially the hierarchy or, or the entire order of the process and finally regulatory pathways that can have two outcomes mutations in such pathways often have distinct and opposite phenotype and this can also be determined using epistasis analysis so the answer to the question is positioning a new gene in the hierarchy of a known genetic pathway is what is done using epistasis analysis okay so if anyone does not have any questions on this we can move on okay next which of the following is used for assigning a new allele to a specific chromosome the options are one factor genetic crosses two factor genetic crosses chromosome walking and rna i so again a round type of question so only one option is correct 
Anyone wants to answer this? So which of the following can be used to uh, assign a new allele to a specific chromosome? Say you have uh, found a particular mutation or a particular gene and want to know which exactly chromosome it is on. So which of the following methods can be used? One factor genetic crosses, two factor genetic crosses, chromosome walking or RNAi? Anyone wants to try and answer this? You can just go ahead and try, it won't matter. At all. Like you can just trying will also help you to learn. Okay. Srividya says B, two factor genetic crosses. Okay. Anyone else wants to try? So the two-factor uh, analysis, so the answer obviously is two-factor analysis as Sri Vidya pointed out. So what happens is that this is something that we have already dealt with in, in the last week lectures. We have uh, seen how we calculate recombination frequency. So you, uh, during genetic mapping and trying to map a particular gene to a particular chromosome, we use a uh, method known as two-factor analysis. What we do is that we find the recombination frequency between the new gene of the new mutant and a known marker mutation. The position of the marker mutation is known. Say it is present with the chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. We know with, where the marker mutation is. And we then can try to calculate recombination frequency with respect to the marker mutation. And if there is the recombination frequency is less than 50%, then we know that if, uh, if uh, the genes are linked, if the genes are linked, that means that they are present on the same chromosome. And if the there is no recombination, uh, there is no recombination frequency that is calculated. That means that the genes are in uh, the particular mutation is not present on that chromosome. This is what two-factor analysis uh, analysis is. So, can someone tell me while calculated recombination frequency? between independently assorting genes that is the uh, genes are present in two different chromosome what is the what uh, could be the value of recombination frequency say our marker mutation was in chromosome 1 and our mutant got, was actually present in chromosome 2 and we go ahead and do a two factor analysis and cal try to calculate the recombination frequency as uh, Morgan did using uh, by calculating the number of recombinants divided by total number of progeny into 100% and calculating in uh, centimorgan how much the distance is. So in case that they are present in two different chromosomes that they, that is they are independently assorting what will be the recombination frequency? You can just go ahead and guess. It will be a percentage value. So you can just try and guess what the value will be. No one wants to guess what the value can be. Okay, someone answered thirty percent. Okay, uh, so you say that um, whoever answered, I did not catch it. But uh, you say that the recombination frequency between the new mutant and the known marker mutation will be 30% if they are independently assorted. So what does independent assortment exactly mean? That they will not be uh, the number of recombinants and the number of normal wild type progeny will be equal because they are independently assorting so the, it will be a 50-50 chance and thus the recombination frequency will be will max out at 50 percent is that okay not okay it won't be 30 a 30 percent is still weakly linked 
uh, around uh, 50% is what we call I say that recombination frequency has maxed out that is these two uh, alleles are independently assorted around 30% you can still say that they are on the same chromosome is that okay yes sir okay and really i guess that also answers your question that you asked that because recombination frequency will max out at 50% then uh, the question of physical distance being calculated greater than 50 cm organ does not come into the question at all do you get what i am trying to say that uh, that you cannot use the centimeter organ distance or the genetic mapping distance in order to absolutely say what the physical distance between the two gene locus are okay next i wanted to also touch upon the three factor analysis that was also looked into in the lectures so you say you have found using a particular marker say b you have found the uh, you have calculated the recombination frequency and found it to be 17% for a new mutation vg so vg is the new mutation and b is our marker but how exactly can i say that where exactly in the entire chromosome does vg lie it can be to the uh, 17 cm organ to the left of b it can be 17 cm organ to the right of b what we do is we take another marker here it is uh, this is cn this is a centromere but we can take it and we again calculate the recombination frequency between all of them so what we get is that between b and cn there is a 7 9% recombination frequency and 9 cm organ distance between b and cn between cn and vg it is 9.5 upon pooling all the data you know that b and cn must uh, if they are 9% like 9 cm organ apart and B and VG are 17 cm organ apart, but still CN and VG are 9.5 cm organ apart. Therefore, this must be the genetic mapping. That is, VG lies to the right of both B and C, and that is uh, using such markers. Say we had a marker here, on to the right of VG. Uh, using all these markers, you can actually narrow down to a very finite spot to where VG might be between two particular markers and you can just then go ahead and uh, sequence that small part and you will get your gene. That is what is known as three factor analysis. Is that okay? Yes, no. Anything? Yes, okay. So, which of the following is used to assigning a new allele to a specific chromosome? The answer is two factor genetic process so we go ahead and look into the suppressor screen suppressor screen is also something that was dealt in the lectures and it is very important which of the following points should you keep in mind while designing and performing suppressor screens the options are the muted phenotype should be readily visible the number of progeny at the f2 generation should be large the number of progeny at the F2 generation should be small and the new mutation must follow Mendelian inheritance pattern. These are the four options and this is more than one option correct. So uh, if anyone wants to try and answer the question, they can. So during suppressor screens, we should be the following, uh, which should be uh, the following should be true. Mutant phenotype should be readily visible, number of progeny should be large, or the mutation must be Mendelian inheritance pattern. Miranel says it should the number of progeny at the F2 generation should be large, and the new mutation must follow Mendelian inheritance pattern. Deepak says 1, 2, and 4. That is uh, readily visible, should be large, number of progeny, and Mendelian inheritance pattern. Anyone else wants to try? So first, in order to understand what exactly suppression screens are, suppressor screens are, let us first look into the phenomenon of suppression. What suppression means is that 
say you have a genotype a b in the wild type the gene both a and b are wild type and they are actually functioning there is a specific interaction between the gene products of a and b and they are functioning normally but when there is a mutation present in a but b is wild type that is a single mutant there the interaction is not proper and the uh, and essentially the gene product or the phenotype gets hampered so we have a mutant phenotype in case of in the second case b has a mutation and a is wild type so we have a single mutant where b is mutated and again the phenotype is not normal and it deviates from the wild type because the gene product interaction is not very proper say in the, we can take an example of enzymes two enzymes must have a very proper uh, enzymatic uh, active site as we have seen already and it fits uh, simplistically as a jigsaw puzzle and the mutation essentially what it causes is it does not allow the proper interaction and the enzyme thus is either non functional or function at the very low uh, efficiency it is a cases with the both single mutants but in case of the double mutant what happens is that the mutation in both of them allows the gene products to again interact properly and it acts uh, the phenotype that is observed is the same as the wild type so the double mutant essentially has the same phenotype as the wild type and this is known as the suppressed mutant and the whole phenomenon is known as suppression in which the double mutant essentially sh shows the same phen uh, phenotype as the wild type whereas the single mutants do not is that absolutely clear did everyone understand what exactly suppression means yes no anything i guess yes so this particular thing is used in suppressor screens what suppressor screens are it is a powerful method to isolate additional genes that function in a particular process so say in this case we uh, got the we, uh, we were tracking the mutation multivalva and you already have a particular worm that uh, has the multivalva phenotype uh, genotype so you have a muv over muv homozygous mutation what you want to know is that what other genes are associated with this multivalva phenotype or the valvular formation which genes are associated with the valvular formation so what you do is you take the homozygous multivalva mutants and you again treat them with ems so again you will have mutations in one gene throughout the chromosome throughout the genome a new self that is allow the hermaphrodite to mate with itself so uh, the hermaphrodite produces its own oocytes and sperm and that uh, that's after selfing it is essentially a monohybrid uh, looks like a dihybrid cross and in the f1 progeny we have multivalva or multivalva still here and we have the mutation that is carried forward with uh, we have a heterozygous muta mutation that is carried forward when you self it again in the f2 progeny so we have uh, we will have one phenotype which will look like this which will be multivalva over multivalva and our homozygous for our second mutation now what we do is we look for mutations that will revert back to the wild type so essentially this muv mutation and m mutation will act in the same way the a and b were acting in the, our previous slide and this m, uh, small m over small m will suppress the multivalval phenotype and the entire uh, worm will be wild type in nature so we looked for non muv revertants in either f1 or f2 so the revertant will signify a suppressed mutant and that is where the, then we can say suppression is going on that means the mutation that was introduced is actually related to the muv or the valvular formation phenotype but there are a lot of considerations that we have to look into in this particular case the consideration is that we have to screen a large amount of genomes the entire reason is that you have first you uh, there in the first 
screen, mutagenesis screen, where you found the MUV mutation, you had to mutagenize one gene at a time and look, uh, and you looked at say 10,000 progenies. That is, there was one 10,000 chance that a gene that was involved in vulval formation is hit. And from that particular gene, you got MUV. In this, in this suppressor screen, not only the mutation needs to be involved in vulval formation, it needs to be, uh, it needs to suppress MUV, the, uh, it needs to be able to suppress the MUV mutant. That is a lot, uh, like the probabilities uh, goes a lot down, like a huge, uh, like you have a very, very, very small chance of hitting a mutant that actually suppresses your previous MUV mutation. And that is why in order to find any worms, you have to uh, look for a large amount of organism. So you have to have a large F2 population in which you will look into. Therefore, the key to design the screen is that a large number of mutagenized gametes can be observed. Not only that, you have to also understand when you are in a particular plate only you are looking at thousands of worms and you are looking at tens, of, uh, tens to hundreds of such plates the particular mutation should actually just pop out to your eyes. You cannot just look for eye color or any uh, eye color say or any particular mutation that is very difficult to look into that you will have to look into it through a microscope and understand. And that uh, in that particular case you have the mutation should be something that pops out and should be very distinct. Thus the answer to the question in is the mutant phenotype should be readily visible, the number of progeny in F2 generation should be very large and the new mutation must follow Mendelian uh, inheritance pattern. Is that okay? Yes, no, anything? I guess that was okay. I am audible, right? Okay. So we move on to the second type of screen that we discussed that were the synthetic screens. The two mutant alleles are said to be synthetic when the phenotype of one is suppressed by the other in the double mutant. One is epistatic over the other. A phenotype is displayed only in the double mutant and both alleles are of two paralogous genes. When are two mutant alleles said to be synthetic is the question. We have the four options. Anyone wants to go ahead and try? Deepak says 3, the phenotype is displayed only in the double mutant. Anyone else? Shri Vidya also says, a phenotype is displayed only in the double mutant. Okay. So let us look into what exactly are synthetic genes and what is exactly the synthetic screen. Uh, this uh, example was dealt with in the class itself. Say we have two particular mutations, uh, mutants, NOS1 and NOS2. Two particular genes, NOS1 and NOS2. When either of NOS1 and NOS2 are mutated, so in the first case NOS2 is mutated and we uh, still have the fertile phenotype. That is the same as the wild. In the second case, when NOS1 is mutated, we still have the fertile phenotype which is same as the wild. But when both NOS1 and NOS2 are mutated, we have the sterile phenotype. That is, in the double mutant only, we will see a new phenotype. That is what a synthetic mutation means. And this, uh, using a synthetic screen, we can identify such synthetic mutants. But what does uh, this do? Like suppressor mutations, synthetic mutations help us determine or identify genes that function in a single pathway. That is, this helps us understand that 
they uh, uh, essentially, uh, essentially what happened is what's probably happening is nos1 and nos2 both were redundant in function that is both of them were acting or performing the same function that is why when nos either of nos1 or nos2 was inactivated the other partner was able to perform the function entire that is they were redundant but when both of them were knocked out or uh, inactivated then only you saw a phenotype that means that the uh, entire biosynthetic pathway that they were controlling is completely stopped and using synthetic mutation we can identify such genes that function in a single pathway. Thus the two mutant alleles are said to be synthetic when a phenotype is displayed only in the double mutant. Is that okay? Check here. That's fine, I guess. So we move. So uh, we have combining the previous two questions on synthetic screens and suppressor screens. We have the following question: Which of the following methods can help you identify multiple or additional genes functioning in a single pathway? The options are suppressor screens, blue-white screen, chromosome walking and synthetic screen so which of them will help us identify multiple or uh, multiple or additional genes that function in a single pathway so taking our knowledge from the previous question what can be the answer to this you can just enter it in the chat box one and two suppressor screen and blue white screen anyone else Deepak says one and two Okay, so from the last two questions, we just saw that if we wanted to determine multiple genes or mutants that are effectively functioning in a single pathway, we use essentially two screens the suppressor screen and the synthetic screen. That is what we just saw. In suppressor screen, we try to uh, uh, in the we try to take the homozygous mutant again, mutate it. I can run it through a mutagenesis screen in order to get which other mutant can suppress it and thus both of those genes are acting in the same pathway and in synthetic genes inactivating both genes gives uh, uh, having a double mutant only gives us a phenotype which means the both of them were acting in the single pathway thus the answer is suppressor screen and synthetic screen blue white screen Deepak is used in uh, when we use uh, when we do transformation bacteria in order to understand if our particular vector insert is actually uh, what transformed our particular bacteria so it is uh, essentially a reporter method or a method in which we can identify if our transformation has worked it is completely separate from our discussion in development biology okay yes sir okay Which of the following statements are false? AC induces or anchor cell induces vulval development. PNPs are pluripotent. Tertiary fate is the ground or the uninduced fate. Hypermorph, neomorph, and antimorph are types of recessive mutants, mutations. So this particular question comes from C. elegans vulval development example that was taught in the lectures last week and we have uh, this is a multiple choice answer type of question so I would request everyone to try and answer this. So the following statements are false. Deepak says 4. Anyone else? Brunelli says 2 and 4. PNP is a pluripotent and uh, number 4 hypermorph, neomorph, and antimorph and types of decisive mutants. Anyone else wants to try? Sure. 
Srividya says true, number 2 is false, P and P is a pluripotent. Okay, so this particular example uh, was actually taught in class and I will just go through it quickly. So during world world development what exactly happens is that we have a particular blood cell which is known as anchor cell which uh, and the number of P and P's that is uh, P followed by a number and a small p the, which shows us the lineage of the cell so P6 dot P, P7 dot P, P5 dot P and these are present on the outer layer and these are what will form the vulva. What happens is that the anchor cell signals the P7P, the P6P and P5P that is the uh, that is the PNP that are present in the middle with P6P getting the highest amount of activation signal. Using this particular signal P6P essentially forms the vulva and assumes the primary fit whereas P7P and P5P uh, take over the secondary fate and form the lateral parts of the vulva. Other PNPs that are present in this layer and do not receive any signal from the anchor cell are going to the uninduced fate of forming hypodermis that is the normal hypodermal layer that is formed. The interesting part is that if the anchor cell was not there every one of them would have formed the tertiary fate that is they would have formed hypodermis. And what this means is that all the PNPs and other examples in which the particular signal was given to uh, the lateral PNP that P4 and P3 where we saw the multifulva forming, there we understood that these PNPs have every one of them had the potential to form the vulva but because anchor cell was only signaled to P6, P8, P7, P and P5, P, they only formed the primary and the tertiary, uh, secondary fates. Thus all of the PNPs are multipotent. I, and can form whatever they want but depending on the signal they assume particular fields. Second is also obvious that AC or the anchor cell is very important for uh, development of the vulva and what was another option. Tertiary fate is the ground state because the, when you do not have the anchor cell you have all the cells trying to uh, take over the tertiary fate that is that is the ground state which is there and the sig only the signaling is what changes or deactivates them to the or the what gives them the primary or the secondary fates. So this option was wrongly marked obviously uh, it missed the false part so the only option will be 4. Hypermorph, neomorph and antimorphs are three types of recessive mutation this is false because we have won't, uh, uh, just seen that uh, hypermorphic, neomorphic and antimorphic mutations are actually dominant mutations. Is that okay with everyone? Then we can move on. So, sir, the answer was four or? The answer was four. The answer was four. The answer was four. The, this is something uh, that was opposite. I just marked the opposite. The answer was four. Hypermorph, neomorph, and antimorph are uh, types of recessive mutations is false. Everything else is true. So, we move on. What is the role of hypodermal cell HYP7 in the development of C. elegans vulva. The options are it activates tertiary fate in PNP cells except P6P, induction of secondary fate in PNP cells, induction of anchor cell fate and suppression of induced fates in PNP cells. So, uh, what exactly is, so we discuss the role of what the anchor cell does. So the next question is what does the hypodermal cells HYP7 uh, do or what is their role in C. elegans development. Do they activate the tertiary fate, induce the secondary fates, induce the anchor cell fate or suppress the induced fates in PNPs. Anyone wants to try and answer this? This is a round type of question so only one of the options are correct. Okay. So we have just discussed what the anchor cell does. 
Anchor cell will produce an inductive signal which uh, allows P6P, P5P, and P7P to uh, undergo the primary and secondary fate and form the actual wall. What the hypodermis HYP cell is that they repress this intrinsic valvular program. So, what essentially is the case is all the PNPs have the tendency to assume the primary and secondary fate. But there is a negative signal coming from the hip 7 epidermis that uh, that causes all of them to assume the tertiary fate. What the anchor cell does is its inductive signal uh, negates the negative signal coming from hip 7 uh, epidermis and allows the PNPs in the middle to assume the non their normal induced fate. So what HIP7 does is it gives a negative signal that does not allow the PNPs to enter the primary and secondary fate. Anchor cell, uh, the inductive signal from the anchor cell and the which reaches only P5, P, P6P and P7P allows them to assume the primary and the secondary fate whereas all the others under the negative signal from HIP7 epidermis form the normal uh, hypodermis layer and uh, do not form the vulval. Uh, do not form the valve and thus uh, assume the tertiary fates. Thus, the answer is suppression of induced fates in PNP cells. Hyper HIP7 hypodermal cell uh, suppresses the induced fates in uh, PNP cells. So, if there was no anchor cell and only HIP7 hypodermal cell was there, then every one of them will be tertiary in nature. Is that okay? I guess that is okay. So we move on to the uh, to mosaic analysis that is a powerful tool that helps us to track various mutations. And the question is which of the following is uh, correct with respect to mosaic analysis. The options are loss of uh, the wild type allele is directed in specific cell types. A cell marker is cell specific marker is essential in mosaic analysis. Mosaic analysis helps us define the anatomical focus of a gene function. Mosaic analysis is used to reveal the developmental potentials of a cell. These are the four options. What exactly is correct with respect to mosaic analysis? So anyone wants to try and answer this? Shriyan says 3 and 4. Mosaic analysis helps us define the anatomical focus of a gene function and the mosaic analysis is used to reveal the developmental potentials of a cell. Anyone else wants to answer? Deepak says 2 and 3. A cell specific marker is essential for mosaic analysis and mosaic analysis helps to define the anatomical focus of a gene function. Anyone else? Okay. So let us first look into what exactly mosaic analysis is. What in mosaic analysis what we do is we have two uh, we have a particular mutation that we uh, are trying to follow. Okay, so it is not very visible. So in this case we have a particular mutation that we want to follow. Say the mutation is this small m that is here. We have a homozygous mutant here. What we exactly do is that we want to follow the mutation at various stages of development. So this uh, this particular cell later gives rise to these two daughter cells. And these daughter cells will also give rise to further daughter cells. I do not want to look at the what the mutation does to the parent cell only. I want to look at what the mutation does to various stages. So what happens if the mutation was in this progeny, in this particular division? If what was uh, happens if the mutation was in the next uh, particular cell? And in this way, I can we can actually identify where exactly in which cell the mutation actually affects the developmental process. Say in the parent it affects. In the two daughters, only when the right one uh, in the right cell there is a mutation, then only development is, uh, development is affected. When it is in the left one, no development is affected, development is not affected. 
thus we can say that the progeny that was given rise to this particular left cell is unaffected or does not need the particular gene or the mutation for its developmental process and essentially thus we can say that uh, what various anatomical structures this particular cell forms is unaffected by this gene and so if this gene was say required for vulval development then we can say that if the mutation only in the right cell affects vulval development then it might be that it, the, this right cell is essentially very anatomically uh, the anatomical focus of this particular cell is related to vulval development but whereas if the mutation occurred in the parent cell then every one of the uh, mutation will be carried in every one of the daughters and we could have said that the parent cell also affects but then we, uh, we have a broader definition of which cells but in this case if we go down the uh, entire progeny uh, uh, we, uh, we go down the entire cell divisions we can pinpoint which particular cell affects which particular developmental process so what exactly uh, mosaic analysis helps us to it helps us define the anatomical focus of gene action that is uh, which particular gene affects which particular cell at which point and that gives rise to various developmental uh, you know, anomalies and that is what we are trying to do in mosaic analysis so mosaic animals contain both the wild type and the mutant cell what we have here is we have a mutant mosaic as mutant and we have a marker mutation in this particular example we have the ncl mutation which causes a larger nucleolus to occur what we do is that we also insert another uh, fragment of dna which has the homozygous uh, which has the dominant wild type alleles to both of these so till this dominant wild type allele is present uh, in the cell both this ncl and the m mutation will be suppressed and thus the, the cell is genotypically wild but as cell divisions occur because this extra chromosomal dna it will it might get lost at some uh, cell division and when it is lost we have a condition such as this in which the only the homozygous recessive mutants are present so both ncl and m will be expressed and we have the phenotype of the mutant and also of the ncl locus which causes the nuclear uh, nucleolus to be larger why, why do we need a larger nucleolus it helps us to track which particular cells in which particular cells have the uh, have the uh, dominant copies or the wild type copies been lost and thus this might must be my mutant cell so a larger nucleus will just tell me that this is the mutant cell i do not have to do any other analysis but in the other daughter the the particular wild type dna fragment is being carried and that is thus it will be genotypically wild type and this asymmetry will the now help me determine if the mutation is carried by this particular cell does this affect the development of a particular organ if it does then the mutation in this particular cell was important and we can now narrow down that what exactly this cell was doing in the whole developmental process so say for example it was uh, if we were tracking the pnps that is the example we will see we can see at what stage the wild type copy is lost and then determine what exactly the pnp functions are so uh, going through this again so mosaic animals contain both wild type and mutant cells and this can be generated by spontaneous loss of the free duplication that is this can be spontaneously lost and we can just then look at what the mutation does at various stages and the various mutations are recognized by a cell marker such as the nucleolus which uh, enlarges so this is the example of mosaic analysis that was dealt in class as well and we will just quickly go through it so this is the lineage tree of uh, c elegans we have the zygote which divides into ab and p1 where p1 cell lineage gives rise to the hip7 hyperdermis that we are look, uh, looking at and the anchor cell ab then gives rise to aba ab anterior and ab posterior which then divides into abpl and abpr and these lineage gives rise to the pnps where the aba again gives rise to hip7 so we are undergo mosaic analysis using this particular lineage
we look at the point of duplication lost where exactly the while type copy is lost and what effect it causes on the vulnerable phenotype. So if there is no loss, obviously it will be while type that is the entire worm grew with all uh, every time it had the while type copy in all the cells and it obviously grew as while type. If the point of duplication loss was at P0, that is at the zygote itself it was lost, then we have multiple one. That is uh, in the case that we are uh, dealing with here, if the parent lost it, then all of them uh, will uh, not have the wild type copy and obviously the phenotype will be same. If A B lost the duplication, then also we have multiple one. But when A B P L lost it or A B P R lost it, we often have the wild type. That is A B P L or A B P R lineage do not actually are not actually affected by the lin 15 mutation. That is the PNPs are not affected by the lin 15 mutation. Next. If P1 loses it, we have multiple one. If P1 loses it, but there is no uh, anchor cell, that is, the if somehow the anchor cell was removed, ablated, laser ablated, or somehow, then also we have multiple one. But if there is no loss and no anchor cell, we have the vulval, uh, vulvalis phenotype, that is, vulva is not being formed. What the entire thing tells us is that there since there was uh, if the loss occurs in p1 and with or without the anchor cell the phenotype is the same the lin 15 mutation does not affect the anchor cell similarly since in abpl and abpr which gives us to the various pnps we still have wild type even if lin 15 is lost pnps are also not affected by the lin 15 mutation and thus using the mosaic analysis we can see that lin 15 activities required in cells other than the PNPs and the anchor cell. So the entire analysis tells us that what exactly lin 15 does and whatever it does it is does not affect directly the anchor cell and the PNPs. So this is the power of mosaic analysis. So the uh, entire this entire part is uh, if anyone has questions on this entire part they can just go ahead and ask. If not, we can just go ahead and answer the particular question. Which of the following is are correct with respect to mosaic analysis? A cell specific marker such as larger nucleolus is required. Mosaic analysis helps to define the anatomical focus of a gene function. So, which exactly which cells the gene is required as we have just seen or which lineage. Mosaic analysis is used to reveal the developmental potentials of a cell. So, how does a cell or the function of the cell affect the whole entire developmental process? Is something that we just saw, and that is what can be defined using mosaic analysis. So, does anyone have any questions regarding this particular question? Uh, this particular question. Anyone wants to ask anything? Okay. So we have the next question on mosaic analysis. Mosaic analysis is used to primarily study one the spatial patterning of cells, anatomical focus of gene function, anatomical focus of gene expression, and gene gene interaction. So this is a single choice correct answer. Uh, anyone wants to try and answer this? So round type of questions, single choice is only correct. And then also try answer this. Deepak says two analytical focus of gene function. Shrians also says two analytical focus of gene function. Anyone else? Okay. So looking at our last discussion, only, we just saw that mosaic analysis is used to primarily study the anatomical focus of gene function. So, we will move on to the next question. Say, so this is a like longer question, we have two questions but from this particular statement. So, in a newly discovered dog species, loss of function in mutation in gene A results in shorter legs and loss of function in gene B leads to longer legs than wild type. 
in the gene a gene b double mutant the legs are longer like what is seen in the gene b single mutants so in case of single mutant gene a we have a shorter leg in case of single mutant gene b we have longer leg in both if both are mutated we see longer legs like the gene b mutant so the question is if both gene a and gene b function in the same genetic pathway that control the length of the legs which one functions upstream of the other based on the above data options are gene a acts upstream of gene b gene b acts upstream of gene a and insufficient data so i would ask you to just think it through and try and answer this so in a double mutant the gene b's uh, phenotype is dominant and based on that we are being asked if we can predict that which gene acts upstream of which one gene a acts upstream of b or gene b acts upstream of a anyone who wants to try and answer this this is like 50 50 anyone can try and be correct half the time Shyam says two. Gene B acts upstream of gene A. Anyone else? Deepak says one. Very nice. Gene A acts upstream of gene B. Anyone else wants to try? Okay. So let us look into what exactly uh, is happening here. So this particular question is an example of analysis of a signaling pathway and uh, we will go through an another example in order to understand what exactly is happening see a particular mutation in gene a gives us a repressed expression or a repressed phenotype mutation in gene b gives us constitutive expression or a, a constitutive phenotype like the positive phenotype so a has a negative phenotype b has a positive phenotype phenotype of the double mutant when both of them are mutated gives repressed reported phenotype if both of them are mutated and the resultant phenotype is the same as a then the following can be interpreted that a is closer to the reporter and b is actually functioning upstream in the double mutant in a signaling pathway whichever phenotype is seen in the double mutant that phenotype is actually downstream so a and b gives a repressed reporter function or a negative uh, expression that is same as single a mutant therefore a is downstream b is upstream so b is above a is here and then we have the reporter but what exactly is the relationship between all of these so a gives rise to a mutation in a gives rise to a repressed reporter expression that is wild type a should actually positively regulate the reporter and so have, we have a with a plus sign and an arrow to the reporter mutation in b gives rise to a constitutive reporter expression that is loss of function of b actually gives us constitutive expression that is wild type b should have negatively regulated the pathway and thus b negatively regulates which always is shown by a hammerhead arrow a and there then a positively regulates the re re uh, reporter next if the thing was the opposite that is a double mutation in a and b gives constitutive reporter expression that is the double mutant has the same phenotype as the single mutant b then what we can uh, say is that say the uh, same signaling path in a signaling pathway when the uh, double mutant has a particular phenotype that is equivalent to the b single mutant there was b must be downstream so b is the last b just before the report and therefore a is we are uh, like before it but what is the expression pattern again uh, again b gives constitute the loss of function of b gives constitutive expression 
that is normal wild type b should have been a negative regulator of the reporter a uh, loss of function of a gives rise to a repressed reporter and uh, repressed reporter expression therefore wild type a should have uh, should have helped in the reporter expression or should have positively regulated the expression and thus a essentially negatively regulates b which negatively regulated the reporter and thus a wild type A helps in the positive expression of the reporter. And this was like complicated. I would like you to just read through it and tell me if you have understood it or not. Not at all understood, understood, yes, no, anything will help. Would you like me to go through it again? Anyone? Understood, please. Okay. So I would request everyone to go through this slide again, like uh, you are obviously getting the powerpoints uh, via the MPTL uh, portal also on my channel the powerpoints are uploaded. I would request you to go through the slide again or you can just go to the reference molecular cell biology by Lodi all, and there also there is a long paragraph on how exactly this happens. So getting back to our question, in the uh, single mutant A we have shorter legs, in the single mutant B we have longer legs, in the double mutant we have the phenotype as B, therefore B is downstream, therefore A acts upstream of B. Completely simple. Okay. So we move on to the second part of the question. What is the nature of the genetic interaction between gene A and gene B? B suppresses A, A suppresses B, A activates B, B activates A. So we have already established that A acts upstream of B. So next question is, what is the action of A on B? So since A acts upstream, either gene A suppresses gene B or gene A activates gene B. So what should be the answer? Uh, here is the information again. Gene A results in shorter legs, gene B results in longer legs, double mutant has gene B phenotype. And G we have uh, we already know gene A acts upstream of gene B. So what should be the interaction between gene A and gene B? Does gene B suppress gene A or gene uh, A activate gene B? Two. Two means gene A suppresses gene B. Anyone else? Okay. So we go back here again. So the entire um, uh, question is essentially this particular diagram itself. And we had the same thing. A actually had repressed reporter expression or shorter legs. B had longer legs. We know A acts upstream of B and thus A suppresses B. It's the, same, the diagram is the same in which a B gives, uh, gives us a long, uh, a mutant in B gives us a longer leg. So obviously wild type B should repress the reporter. Similarly A should repress, the, repress B because they act in like the mutant a allows shorter legs, whereas the mutant B allows longer legs. Thus, A should suppress B. The answer is gene A suppresses gene B. Anyone has any difficulty in this, you can just go ahead and ask. If that you did not understand, I will explain again. Okay. So, that was all we had for today. The references to the slides are obviously Introduction to Developmental Biology, Scott Gilbert, 9th edition. This is again the YouTube link on which every one of the videos are uploaded. 
there are other references also in this particular slide uh, those include load the molecular cell biology by lodish at all and that is a molecular biology book that uh, yes. yes so what i was trying to say is that uh, the other references are from the mo book molecular cell biology by lodish shetta you can go through the particular diagrams that i have uh, referred to in this particular slides you can just read about what is written about the diagrams and you can better understand what exactly was taught i would also request everyone watching the video that please go through the week slides uh, and the week lectures before joining the pmr session it helps us a lot and that was all i had for today if uh, you have any questions you can just go ahead and post it in the discussion forum or in the comment section in the youtube videos i thank everyone for joining the lecture